the single eye entitled the vision of god wherein is unfolded the mystery of divine presence so to be in one place finitely in appearance as yet in every place no less present and whilst he is here he is universally everywhere infinitely himself pinned by the learned doctor causinus and published for the good of all saints by gil randall psalms 139 verse 7 whether shall I flee from thy spirit? Whether shall I go from thy presence? London, printed for John Streetner at the Sign of the Bible in Lode, 1646. The Epistle to the Reader No thing is or ever was endeavored by most men with more industry and less success than the true knowledge of the true God. And as in the vision and knowledge of him standeth a light eternal, so in the non-knowledge or wrong knowledge of him or anything for him which is not himself lieth all loss and misery. This point, therefore, being that one thing necessary in the true knowledge or dark ignorance whereof consisteth life and death, good and evil, God and the devil, if this cornerstone be rightly founded, and the whole structure superstructured thereon, it proveth wisdom's house, withstandeth all assaults and trials. But otherwise it is the house of folly, and the tower of confusion and destruction, that there is a God amongst all men are convinced. But who or what this God is, almost all men are ignorant of, after the knowledge and worship of this God. All men are so principled and carried on, that rather than they be or thought to be without him, and the knowledge of him, the creature will create his creator to himself, and his fancy shall give essence and being to this God. All men may be reduced under four heads or notions. First, there are atheists who own no God. Secondly, profess known ignorance, who acknowledge implicitly a God but him to them an unknown God. Thirdly, there are the ignorant knowers, who thinking they know God, know nothing else than God setting up something for God which by nature is no God. Fourthly, there are the true knowers who know thee, John 17, 3, only true God truly. The first half not so much as a conceit of a God, the second conceives of God, but ignorantly without substance or so much as image who or what. The third doth conceive of God not so substance but image. The fourth not conceives but knows, not God an image, but essence and substance, not anything for God but the true and substantial God of these four states of men. The last only is the state of knowledge. The other three states are of ignorance, which arise from their proper cause, darkness. And that is positive in the first, negative in the second, privity in the third, but light itself is only extent and existence in the last state. The first errs in denying a God, the second is not knowing a God, the third in not knowing the true God, in this two ways, either in the adjective or adverb in the adjective, they know not the true God, or in the adverb, they know not this true God truly. Many are guilty of the first error, more of the second, most of the third. But few and few are the partakers of the perfection of the last. And as there is graduation in the three first states, so is there in the evil of them the first bad, the second worst, the third worse. And so much is the worst as it is satanized and transformed into an angel of light, it being religious, sublimate, idolatry. Reader, by what hath him spoken thou, must gather that the God is either known or not known. If not known, whence it flows, either from positive, negative, or privation, darkness, and of all these, the last is worst, wherein man is most active, and seemingly seeing, and knowing. How miserable, therefore, are we deceived, who the more we seek, the further we are off from the true knowledge, and finding out of God. 
that therefore thou and there to be known, for although God is neither any one thing, many things or all things of your creation, yet he is he all and in all, and by us to be seen dearly therein, be being all and in all. Romans 1. Yea, when they have apprehended him above all, yet do they confirm him within their own fancies and imaginations, which are no less finite than any other thing. Thus they deal with him as the people in Isaiah, with their wooden gods. They hew, chop, and cut off what seemeth them good. And when it is brought to the idea of their own brain, then it is God. And the rest they burn as not essential to that God they have shaped out to themselves. And this is to show the Godhead and the divine offense with the whole glory of the gospel into mere conceit and some levit vanity. And that is spiritual and invisible idolatry even as to make corporal shapes and sensible appearances of him is so gross visible, and bodily idolatry. Be thou admonished, Christian brother, in this point. It is the easiest matter that may be to miscarry herein, it being the nighest and deepest of all secrets. The knowledge of God consists and opposes in opposites and contradictions to the wisdom of the flesh, and he is least known by reason of his seeming, like that which is withstanding, is furthest from himself. For as all being substantial and real hath also a false and imaginary being, the shadow of the true being, as the height hath its opposite depth, so there is the true God, and his contrary, even the false and as the material substances, not the essence, or substance is the object of sense, but color, magnitude, and other accidents, even so, not the real essence of God, is the, the resistance with something for God in the seat of God, being nothing else than God, and contrary to God, but the sound and unerring knowledge of him standeth in your knowledge of your man, Christ Jesus, and whosoever hath seen him hath seen the Father also. But he is not a dead image of him, but a lively or living image of the invisible God. Yet the fuller or brightness of his glory and character of his person for God is manifested in the flesh, which is the great mystery of godliness. And till he be Emmanuel, God with us, God in us, there is no true vision or knowledge of him. For as nothing is in the understanding but what is in the sense first, and as nothing in the sense is a viable till it live in the light of the understanding within and at home, so there is no true living knowledge of God within us till he be in us formed in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the divine argument of this little work selected and called out of the most elaborate pieces of what learned Dr. Pausanias, whose argument herein is chiefly and only to shadow forth unto thee the being and existence of the finite God with and in the finite, which is suitable to the state of his recipient subject. For because the infinite cannot be infinitely received by the finite, nor can the infinite become finite as in himself, yet is he so in the finite's capacity as finite and contracted, giving himself forth in a wonderful manner so that he that is immovable moveth, and the unchangeable changes with thee. And though no alteration in time, place, or other thing can be unto him or in him, Yet is he so immovable, as yet now viable and so inseparably assistance with his creatures in everything that he that is neither here nor there properly is yet here and there, and so here as if not there, and so with thee as if with none else, wondrously giving himself all to every one, as if he were all but one. So that if the expressions may be born with all, he is finitely infinite and infinitely finite. He is, is immovably movable and movably immovable. The active and the passive, the receiver and the received, 
because he that is infinitely above thee makes himself to be to thee what he is in thee and makes thee to be what thou art in him he clothes himself with flesh reason sense and the form and the nature of his servant once who yet is above all and the lord over all this is a high and hard saying who can bear it yet i say unto thee reader if God give unto thee a seeing eye and understanding heart to read in this author, in the spirit of light and truth, these things will be easier and more real to thee, which is the desire which he desires for thee, who is a lover of thee in the truth of Jesus. G.R. In introduction, I will now lay open unto you, my dearly beloved brethren, what I had before promised concerning the easiness of mystical divinity, for I judge you, whom I know to be led with a zeal of God, worthy to have this treasure opened unto you, though very precious and most fruitful. But first, I beseech the Almighty, who only can express and declare himself, to give me his word from above, in utterance that, according to your capacity, I may expound those wonders which are revealed above and beyond the sight of sense, reason, and understanding. And I will endeavor after the most simple and ordinary manner to bring you experimentally in the most sacred darkness, while you shall be feeling and perceiving the presence of the unapproachable light. Every one of you shall attempt in the best man that God shall give you leave continually to come nearer and nearer and hear by a most sweet morsel to forecast that supper of eternal happiness wherein we are called in the word of life by the gospel of Christ, blessed forevermore. End of the introduction. The prefix. Of all the means whereby I can endeavor that the manner of man be lifted you up to divine things, I hold it best to do it by a solemnitude. But amongst human works, I found no image more fit and convenient for our purpose than the image of one that sees all things, where thou be there everywhere great store yet least you should fail in the practice which requires such a sensible figure i send your charity such a table as i could have for the present containing a picture of one that looks everywhere which i call the image of god ma'am that you shall fasten in some place for example on a north wall and then shall all you brethren stand about it a little distance from it and look upon it and every one of you shall find by experience that from what place soever he looks upon the same it shall seem that none but himself alone is seen or looked upon by the picture and that brother that stands on the east side of it will imagine that the face looks eastward at him only so he that stands on the south side will think it looks southerly and he on the west westerly and first you will wonder how it can be that it should look upon you all and every one of you at once for the imagination leaving off on frame 13 on the right hand side at the very top of him that stands in the east cannot conceive the figure looking any other way namely to the west or the south then let the brother which was in the east place himself in the west and he shall perceive the countenance fixed on him in the west as it was before when it was in the east and because he knows the picture to be fixed and unmoved he will admire the change of the unchangeable countenance and if fixing his eye on the image he walketh from the west to the east he will find that the eye of the picture goes continually along with him and if from the east he return to the west it will in like manner not forsake him and he will wonder how it was unmovably moved neither shall his imagination be able to conceive how it should possibly be moved with another that meets him and goes with a contrary motion and if for further trial b makes his brother looking still upon the image go from the east to the west whilst himself at the same time goes from the west to the east in meeting him ask him if the eye or sight of the picture go along with him and shall bear that it doth so though it go along with himself too he will believe himself and if he should not believe him he would not think it possible and so by his brother's relation in telling him he will come at length to know that the countenance of the picture accompanies all men 
though they go contrary ways. He shall therefore find by experience that immovable face is so moved to the east that it is at the same time likewise moved to the west and so to the north that is likewise moved to the south and so to one place that it is also moved to all places and so relates to one motion that it relates to all at one and whilst he considers how that vice age forsakes no man he sees likewise how it takes so diligent care of every one and seems to observe him who looks upon it so particularly as if it took care for nobody else insomuch that it cannot be conceived by him whom it beholds how it should look after anybody else and he shall further perceive how it takes as particular notice of the least creature as it doth of the greatest and of the whole universe now from this sensible appearance my purpose is to lift you up my most beloved brethren by a certain practice of devotion unto mystical divinity when i shall have premised three things necessary hereto end of the preface